The Commonwealth of the early 90s was still small in terms of geography. John Hancock knew that to expand the economy and to accommodate the tens of thousands of immigrants arriving every year, that he had to expand the borders of the Commonwealth. In this series we will look at the expansion of the Commonwealth North into New Hampshire and Vermont and the conflict that arose due to that decision. In this episode we will look at the background of the conflict and the initial steps that would lead to years of fighting. From the moment that the Commonwealth was founded, John Hancock began to see the possibility of restoring the New England Commonwealth in its entirety. Of creating a civilization that could right the wrongs that had led to the ruin of the previous civilization. As he explained to some of his closest friends and colleagues. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. To become a beacon of hope to the wasteland. The birth of a new world is here. Later as the Far Harbor War was drawing to a close, and the Commonwealth was overflowing with settlers from all across the wasteland, he once again expressed his vision in a speech to Congress. The people that first settled this land hundreds of years ago, came here with the dream of not just creating a free land, but to spread that freedom to the rest of the continent, where we can do no less for the future of the Commonwealth. Hancock's vision coincided with the hopes and fears of others in the Commonwealth. Those in his own progressive party saw the growth of the Commonwealth as the logical and inevitable consequence of spreading civilization. That once set in motion, would not stop till it reached the ocean on the opposite side of the continent. Although the Conservative Party opposed the expansion and growth of the Commonwealth, raiders coming out of New Hampshire were a daily menace on the northern frontier. During the Raider War of 2289, many Raider bands fled the Commonwealth and headed north into the wilderness of New Hampshire. They would sometimes sneak over the border looking for food, loot, and slaves to carry back north. Though the Commonwealth Marshal's service could deal with individual Raiders, sometimes dozens of Raiders would rampage south of the border. The 13th Minuteman Company, raised from former raiders and gunners was sent to the northern border of the Commonwealth and tasked to keep the Commonwealth secure. However, the unit was badly led, equipped, and motivated. The conservatives maintained that it was the duty of the Minutemen to end this menace once and for all. Even if it meant invading and taking permanent control of the area. The colonial party, representing the territory of Far Harbor, desperately wanted Far Harbor to be formally recognized as an integrated part of the Commonwealth and not just a colony. Just a couple hundred miles separated them from the rest of the Commonwealth, and they wanted that gap to be filled in. These disparate interests came together and clamored for the Commonwealth to take a more active role in the northern area known as the New Hampshire region. Collectively, they came to be known as the Continentals. Nicknamed the Green Granite for its steep forests and towering mountains, the states of Vermont and New Hampshire had a unique post-war experience. Lacking any large cities or major military bases, the states were spared direct nuclear strikes. Most of the urban population that did live in the states fled to Boston or New York looking for help from the government that no longer existed. But once there, were unable to return. Those left were a mix of farmers, survivalists, and anti-government extremists. They saw the war in a positive light and believed that now they could live without the interference of the modern world intruding upon them. A few weeks later the fallout began to drift in. Although the area had been spared direct nuclear strikes, clouds of radioactive waste began drifting in from other parts of the country. More died as a result. Those that remained quietly lived on their farms and in the forests, shunning the abandoned cities in the area. When caravan traders brought word that the Commonwealth Provisional Government, or the CPG, was forming in Boston, some New Hampshire residents wondered if they should join this government. In a rare meeting of settlements, the idea was debated and rejected. Later when it was revealed that the CPG had been massacred, the locals were glad that they had not attended. Occasionally raiders, super mutants, or feral ghouls might enter the area. The inhabitants formed the Green Mountain Militia to deal with such threats. The Green Mountain Militia, or the GMM, was a strictly voluntary force made up of local settlers and farm guards. 
Sometimes members might show up when called, sometimes they might not. It was generally understood that each member had the primary responsibility for their own defense. The GMM was in turn split up into four major groups. The four major leaders of the militia groups were Leonard Webster, leader of the Concord Crusaders, a collective of farmers operating in northern New Hampshire around the city of Concord. Joshua Chase, captain of the Manchester Militia, possibly the most pro-Commonwealth figure in New Hampshire. Elijah Allen, a pre-war farmer that had turned into a ghoul, he led his band of militiamen for decades, from his farm near Rutland. And Matt Vanderberg, leader of the Vermont Guard, a group descended from survivalists in northern Vermont near Burlington. When external threats appeared, these four groups would band together to form the Green Mountain Militia. The only major clash that the militia had fought was against a large party of slavers from the pit in 2259. In a week-long battle, the slavers were continually ambushed by bands of militia operating from deep inside the forests. The slavers were finally crushed at the Brattleboro watershed. Those slavers that were captured were hung off the side of the West River Bridge as a grisly warning to others. After the disastrous raid of 2259, slavers would avoid New Hampshire for the next 30 years. Life in the New Hampshire region was generally quiet until 2289. Raiders fleeing the wrath of the Minutemen and Brotherhood began arriving in southern New Hampshire. They began harassing farms and small settlements. In response, the Green Mountain Militia was reformed. Using the mountains and forests, they began tormenting the raiders. Driving them away from the countryside and into the abandoned cities and towns. Using these as bases, the raiders began to pillage surrounding farms and to raid into the Commonwealth. By 2294, both sides were effectively stalemated. The raiders were unable to control the forests and countryside, but the militia was unable to drive out the raiders from their urban bases. The political pressure in the Commonwealth to do something about New Hampshire built up towards the end of 2294. Conservatives paid publications to run news articles in favor of the Commonwealth entering New Hampshire to deal with the raider problem. Settlers in Far Harbor established a series of coastal forts headed south towards the Commonwealth. Progressives demanded that the benefits of democracy be spread into the wastelands of New Hampshire. Commercial groups also had a vested interest for entering New Hampshire. Construction companies saw the benefit in opening up new stands of forests for lumber. Land speculators saw the massive profits possible in selling lands to potential colonists. Public opinion however was still split on the idea of entering New Hampshire in force. Many wanted to stay out of New Hampshire. Settlements west of the Commonwealth were being created and there was virtually no opposition to picking up discarded lands. In addition, Colonel Preston Garvey testified in Congress in July of 2294. Signs of increased supermutant activity had been detected by Minuteman patrols deep in the glowing sea and it was possible that a large force of mutants was preparing to attack the Commonwealth. He asked Congress to strengthen the southern garrisons rather than send troops north. However, his report to the President was classified and very few in Congress listened to his plea for more troops. Colonel Garvey returned south to watch the glowing sea. An event finally changed popular opinion. Raiders struck Coastal Cottage in August of 2294. Although the raid itself produced only a few casualties, the press turned this into a major tragedy. The public was furious and wanted action taken. Commonwealth representatives traveled up to New Hampshire to talk to Green Mountain militia leaders. They were either turned away or told to stay out of New Hampshire. The Continental faction in all three parties provided the necessary votes in Congress to authorize the Minutemen to enter New Hampshire. On 15 September, President Hancock directed Colonel Hollis of the Minutemen to begin planning a military incursion into the New Hampshire region to defend the northern settlements and to protect Commonwealth interests. Colonel Timothy Hollis and his command staff drew up plans to enter New Hampshire. Hollis was the commander of the veteran 2nd Minuteman Company and had fought in the Gunner and Raider Wars. 
His family had served in the Minutemen for generations, and it had been his cousin that had commanded the Minuteman unit at the infamous Quincy Massacre years earlier. While Hollis and his staff planned the campaign, squads from the second Minutemen scouts crossed the border dressed as traders. They performed reconnaissance missions to identify raider strongholds and strategic points that would have to be taken. The scouts found that the cities of Manchester, Concord, Portsmouth, Montpelier, and Burlington had significant raider forces in them. They also noted that although the local militias were large, that they were not well organized, and no central leadership existed. Along with the scouts came Commonwealth intelligence agents. They contacted Joshua Chase near Manchester and discussed the raider problem. They also discussed his militia becoming part of the Minutemen. By November of 2294, the Minuteman command staff had come up with a plan of action to enter and crush the main raider bases in New Hampshire. They would spend the winter amassing supplies for the expedition and reviewing the plans with the battlefield commanders. Code named Shining Beacon, the plan would begin in March of 2295. Minuteman forces would enter New Hampshire at several points all at once and crush the raider forces. According to the plan, Joshua Chase's militia would open the road south allowing the 2nd, 3rd, and 13th Minutemen north into Manchester. The 6th Field Artillery would provide fire support. Joshua Chase's militia would declare their allegiance to the Commonwealth and become the 15th Minuteman Company. Once Manchester was secured, the 2nd and 13th would move north towards Concord while the 3rd moved west towards Rutland. Three days later the reserve 11th Minutemen would go north into Vermont to link up with the 3rd in Rutland. The 6th and 9th Minutemen would be airlifted and dropped into Burlington, Vermont by the 8th Air Lance. Burlington was considered to be the back door of the region. Raider gangs escaping from the south would have to pass through here. The 6th and 9th would deny them an escape route. They would take the town and hold it while waiting for the southern force to move north. The second Minuteman scouts would be split up into platoons to provide reconnaissance information for the various groups. Once Rutland and Concord were subdued both groups would drive north to crush Montpelier and then link up with the forces in Burlington. Meanwhile the Navy would land the 1st Marines, the 7th Minutemen, and the 1st Armored Infantry, to crush the raiders in Portsmouth while at the same time, the 14th Minutemen out of Far Harbor would drive south to take Brunswick, Maine. Both coastal forces would meet to take Portland, Maine and complete the land bridge to Far Harbor. Colonel Hollis felt that using overwhelming force against the raiders in New Hampshire would make the expedition go faster and minimize casualties. When asked about the local militias he dismissed them. Either they would get out of their way, or they would side with the Commonwealth as Joshua Chase had. He expected that all hostilities would be over within three months. Little did he suspect that securing New Hampshire would take the better part of a decade and almost lead to the collapse of the Commonwealth. In the next episode we will see what happened when Operation Shining Beacon was launched, how the locals responded, and how quickly plans changed once the Green Mountain Militia became involved.